Hello everyone, um, thank you for your questions, um, your responses to the questions that we set last week about the first nine chapters of The Girl of Ink and Stars, um, the section that was set in Joya. Um, they're coming in really well, so can you please continue doing those if you haven't already, um, and then I will um, compile some questions uh, based on the next section of the text when we reach the end of the middle section. Um, and just to remind you, that the middle section is set in the Forgotten Territories. So, as you'll remember from the last chapter, um, Isabella and uh, Pablo have joined the governor's um, expedition into the Forgotten Territories to go and find Loop. Um, Isabella is disguised herself as a boy um, so that she um, well, was allowed to go. Um, and there is a lot of mystery surrounding Katas, um, the the girl who uh, was who was murdered. There's a lot of mystery surrounding the circumstances under which she was killed, um, and there is some some hints and some foreshadowing um, in the book uh, so far that have suggested that perhaps um, there's another force at play here. There's another danger that perhaps is. Um, going on or existing on the island and we are yet to be introduced to it but we've had quite a lot of clues um, given to us through the uh, the myth that we were um, told about Arinta um, and also about the behaviour of the animals on the island so hopefully in the next section we will find out some more about that so moving on this is chapter 10 it was hushed in the forest the horse high bushes stopped sound the way water does and the torch's light threw everything into shadow. After a couple of men had drawn swords on nothing more threatening than a branch, Governor Adori ordered them to put out the torches. My eyes quickly adjusted and I felt safe in knowing we could not be seen as easily. The route was clear. The trampled bushes, leaking pale sap, were the only break in the undergrowth. I imagined Loop, alone and determined. I'll show you I'm not rotten. I was not needed to navigate while the path was so obvious, so I took out the compass, peering at it through the gloom. Despite fearing for Loop, I could not ignore that I was in the Forgotten Territories at last. I would make a map that Dal would be proud of. Every hundred strides the horses took, I marked a line on the soft leather pad I held in my palm. And every time the compass indicated a change of direction, I scored under these lines, with an arrow showing the new bearings, consulting the stars the way Dal taught me. This was map making at its most basic but it was clear the others would not stop and wait for me to take more accurate measurements. I would just have to rely on memory when it came to drawing up the map. That was how I did it with Loop on our treasure hunt through Gomera's narrow streets. My hand was at my throat before I could stop it, feeling for the locket through my tunic. Marquez narrowed his eyes and I clasped the reins. Maybe it had not been the best idea to bring it with me. None of us spoke for a while. The governor's shoulders were set and he hardly moved for the lilt of his horse. He obviously wanted to go faster but the darkness and the narrow path made it impossible. After a few miles, the horses started to move more cautiously, shaking their heads and whinnying softly. The men drove them forward, digging the spurs on their stirrups into the animal's sides. My horse stopped completely, until Pablo hit it sharply on the hindquarters. It was a few more miles up, a few more miles before any of us realised what was wrong. Finally, Marquez spoke up. What's happening to the trees? We pulled our horses to a stop. The surrounding trees did not look alive. Their leaves were like lace, crisscrossing blackly over tangles of dead branches. I squinted at one, holding my hand behind a leaf. My skin showed through, a lighter dark, webbed by the, by the leaf's veins. Up close, the trunks looked like rock, as though the forest had been fossilised. Forest fires were nothing new on Joya. Dar said this small death was needed and the trees grew back greener, stronger, gave more fruit, even the scrubland that blacked, that backed Gromera occasionally smoked and burnt. But this, this was different. The leaves hung on their stalks, skeletal and black, yet still attached. The broken bushes oozed black sap, as if the trees were feeding off darkness instead of water. A light breeze ran over my exposed neck, and a smell hooking into my nostrils. Something sharper than smoke. It reminded me of the scent that had filled Pablo's room after the fireworks. What was it that Loop said? Something from Asia. Sulphur. Governor Adori spoke the word quietly, almost to himself, but in the dead air of the night it reached us all. Boy, come here. I glanced across at Pablo, but he shook his head. 
Governor Adori was looking straight at me. I nervously nudged the mare towards his horse. That map you have, the old one, does it suggest this change? Without a torch nearby, the inside of the satchel should have been impossible to see. But the wood light, the piece of Dar's bro broken walking stick was shining softly through the thin fabric of my rolled up dress. As I made to pull out the worn map of the forgotten territories, thick fingers closed roughly around my wrist. Marquez had dismounted, his face illuminated by the glow from my bag. That, what's that? Without waiting for an answer, he reached into the satchel. He quickly touched the fragment, as if testing for heat, then pulled it out, sending maps and instruments falling to the floor. As he held up the glowing wood, its pale light was cast further, and the men shrank back. The governor dismounted, drooping heavily onto the ground. Swinging my leg clumsily over the mare, I half fell to retrieve the papers and tools before they were trampled by hooves or the governor's boots. I crouched down, silently cursing myself for allowing the fragment to be found. Well, what is it? repeated Marquez, as he passed it to Governor Adori. Why does it shine like this? I don't know. Where did it come from? My father. Before him? asked Adori. I don't know, I lied. It was passed down to him. Without commenting further, the governor slipped the woodlight into his belt beside his keys. I reached out, but Marquez pulled me back by the shoulder, fingers digging hard into my shoulder. My eyes watered, and blinking rapidly, I dropped my arm. The governor looked at me expectantly. I glared back. The map. Pablo's voice was quiet, but still made me jump. He dismounted and was holding out a pile of papers. Mouthing thanks, I rifled through with shaking fingers and found the map scrolled in its sheath of cloth. Well, the governor was still staring. The trees? I examined the parchment then shook my head. They held no clues. The key just showed the forest to be a mix of dragon and pine trees. I wondered how I would show the black, ma black trees on my map. Marquez tutted impatiently. How much further does the forest stretch? I glanced down, checking the scale against my leather pad. It was inaccurate, but not by much. At least 20 miles in that direction, I pointed west. More if we go straight. And how far to water? My fingers brushed the blue star that marked the waterfall. Twelve. The governor nodded. Take us there. The trees are starting to thin. We won't have a path to follow much longer. Luke would look for water, said the governor, indicating the dried up bed of the Arinta. No, I thought. She's not that sensible. She's looking for the killer. Sir, ventured Marquez. Don't you think it would be better to stop for the night and rise at first light? She's unlikely to be far ahead, and surely she would have stopped to rest. If she has, it's all the more reason to continue, Marquez, snapped the governor. We could catch up. The men are tired, sir, said Marquez cautiously. If we encounter danger, we'll need our strength. And what of my daughter's safety? She would be better served by rested men and rested horses, continued Marquez. We can start tomorrow at a gallop. We'll find her by sundown. I wanted to carry on but with every blink my eyelids felt heavier. Finally, the governor straightened his broad back and spoke to us all. We continue. His glare cut short the murmurs of the men, and I suggest you pick up the pace. I carefully replaced the papers and the instruments in the satchel, rolling the map back into its cloth. When I looked up, the group had already moved on. Only Pablo was there, holding the reins of my horse. Ready? I nodded, grateful he'd stayed behind. Chancing a smile, I reached out for the reins. Instead, he handled me a bundled piece of cloth. My dress. It fell out your satchel. Put it away, quickly. Pablo threw me across the saddle and pushed the horse forward before it even sat up. Thank you. Just pretend better, he snapped. The only reason no one sees is because they don't care enough to look. In the first hours of daylight, the landscape was even stranger. Black Forest had never been mentioned by Masha or the other elders, nor in Dao's story or on Ma's map. What had happened here to make the trees' colours fade? It couldn't be the drought that made the plants grow like this. The wheat in Gramera was still gold, not grey. We rode on for a couple more hours, interrupted, uninterrupted and quiet, except for the horses, and a scratch as they marked every hundred paces on the leather pad. Every line brought us closer to Arintan. Butterflies swooped in my stomach as we neared the waterfall. Pablo and Dar might think it was just a story, but Arinta had always given me courage, and I needed that now. We rounded to a thick, we rounded a thick copse of trees, and my heart sank. No loop. 
and no cascading waterfall. Only the cracked bed of the river Arantara, running low and sluggish. This is the mighty Arantan, said the governor, voice thick with disdain. The others dismounted, but I nudged my horse forward. Around another bend, a rocky overhang rose above my head. A weak trickle ran over the edge, and behind it was a cupped space, a, wa a cave which would have been hidden from view were the waterfall as full as the stories. My knees jarred as I dismounted. Tethering the reins to a tree, I waded into the river, Gabo's boots sloshing and stirring up mud, and I walked into the cave. The space was deeper than I first thought. The entrance was small and low, but at its darkest point was a wide passage leading to another cave where I could stand. I stumbled blindly, feeling my way forward. The walls were dry and oddly warm. I could feel strange horizontal lines on the back wall, as if the rocks had been laid flat together. It made me think of a game Gabo and I had played, singing and layering hands over one another faster and faster, drawing the bottom hand out and trying to be at the top when the song ended. My breath caught. Missing Gabo always crept up like this. I would not allow it. Feeling my way back into the open air, I scooped some water into my hands and drank. It was not the magical waterfall of Dad's stories, but at least there was water. I refilled my empty water flask and put it in my satchel, bringing out the full one from home and placing it on my belt. Dad always said it was very important to use the staler water first on a journey, however tempting it was to drink the freshest. The governor and his men were settling on the riverbanks. I sat next to Pablo on a boulder. What's happening? I whispered. We're going to have something to eat. Stopping an hour at the most, he says. And then? Pablo shrugged, and then we keep going. I'd sleep if I were you. But suddenly didn't, I didn't feel tired, even though we'd ridden through the night and past sunrise. The governor was standing a little apart, scanning the ground, looking for traces of his daughter. He didn't seem able to stand still, as if his anger was turning into hot coals beneath his feet. Guilt churned sharply in my stomach. His eyes flicked towards me, and I looked away. Runts, called Marquez, snapping his fingers. Fetch some wood. I stood up placing the satchel on the rock. I managed to find only a little kindling, but it didn't matter because Pablo emerged from the forest with an enormous bough of what looked like a dragon tree, black like the rest. The men laughed, clapping him on the back, but his face remained set in a scowl. A fire was soon heating up, a pot of stew made with chickens brought by the cook. I shuddered when I passed the pile of plucked feathers, and as the smell wafted through the air, I fed Miss La, grateful she was here, a piece of home even grateful for her pecs. As the stew began to bubble, I, start, I decided to start on my map. But the satchel was no longer on the boulder. Had one of the men mistaken it from their own? My gaze drifted to the river. The satchel was bobbing there. Heart pounding in my ears, I plunged my hands into the water. The satchel sloshed as I opened it, fingers trembling over the buckles. Papers and quills twisted and floated inside, and I ended it like emptying a disappointing catch from a net. Ink had run from Dar's star chart and stained through several sheets of blank paper. It was now a mess of black and red, barely legible. It would be impossible to create an accurate map if I couldn't cross-check the star's positions. But that was not the worst of it. Mars' map was damp and stuck together. I held my breath and peeled it open. Surprisingly, it opened easily. But this was not the map I remembered. The drawings of forests were gone. Instead, the blankness at the centre was full of thick lines the ones I'd seen faintly when I held it up to the light. They looped and crossed, as the silk of a spider's web does, or the channels of a maze. In fact, the more I looked, the more I was certain that this is what it was. The sum of the lines ran through the area we'd just crossed, and there'd been no sign of roads there. Perhaps it was an ancient layout of Joya. No villages were marked, and apart from the lines, the only shapes were circles dotted about the edges. At the centre was another circle, larger than the others and drawn in red, this was the only colour on the map. I hurried over to the fire and held the map up to see more clearly, but the lines dissolved back into the paper, like ink in water, and disappeared. No! Marquez looked at me, frowning. I chased them desperately, chasing them up the map even as they faded. The familiar shapes of the forest were reappearing, along with the names of villages. Within a few seconds, the map was back to normal. I was certain I'd not imagined it. Though what had happened was so fantastical it belonged in one of Dar's stories. What would have made the map change? It was wet when the hidden layer emerged, and when I held it close to the fire it changed back. Now it was dry. I fumbled for my flask, 
pouring water over it. Nothing happened. I tipped the flask over the map again and again, but still nothing happened. I didn't imagine it, I whispered to myself firmly. It was real. Boy, said Governor Adori suddenly, making me jump. He jerked his head. Come here. Pablo raised his eyebrows as if to say hurry up. I walked shakily towards the governor. I thought we'd find her here. I was sure she could not be far ahead. His voice was low but dangerous, shaking slightly. Which way now? Which way should she go? Which way would she go? It was obvious he wasn't talking to me. I waited, the map's transformation slipping from my mind. Luke would go wherever a horse took her. I hoped she wasn't too afraid, as the adventure warned off, and the fear crept in. I felt breathless at the thought of her somewhere in the Black Forest and a killer somewhere out there too. The villagers, said the governor, in a louder, decisive voice, which is the closest? I looked carefully. Grace, sir. He nodded. Grace it is. You'll be ready to lead us there? Yes, sir. And you're working on a new map? I thought of the smudged star chart and sodden paper. About to start, sir. Good. Don't make me regret bringing you. He turned his back and I considered myself dismissed. What is it? asked Pablo quietly. We're going to Gris, a village. I wondered what we would find there. Cook clanged the side of the pot with his spoon and shouted, ready. Governor Adori was the first to eat. He ate by dunking bread directly into the pot, and after he'd eaten his fill, the others fell on the food like starving men. I could hardly eat a chicken stew with Miss Lasso close, and lost my appetite completely, after one of the men started eating so fast the food came out of his nose. I moved off to the riverbank to try and work on the map. Dar's voice rang in my ears as I laid out the pots of ink, damp quills and measuring devices. The trick is leaving spaces for what you don't know. Any man can draw where he's been. Only a cartographer knows how to draw it to fit with where he's about to be. I lent the satchel carefully on a nearby rock and selected the driest piece of paper. I stretched it on the ground, holding down its corners with rocks, then took the marked pad of leather from the pocket of Gabo's trousers and placed it next to everything. Before I started to draw, I looked around at the trees, casting shadows even in the early morning light. I tried not to imagine something looking back at me. Taking a deep breath, I dried the nib of the reed quill on my tunic dipped it into the black ink and began to draw a new map of my island. It would not stay forgotten. And that is the end of chapter 10. So, slightly longer chapter that one. Um, so we have moved into the Forgotten Territories and there's no sign of loop. Um, they went to the waterfall, Arantara, um, expecting, and Isabella was expecting it to be um, like her dad had told her in the stories. Uh, you know, sort of full of water and uh, magical and powerful, but um, it wasn't. It was a trickle of a stream um, that was all that was left. But then we had that strange thing happen with the map. So the map went in the water and then it suddenly changed. But then when it dried again, it wasn't there. But when she tried to then, you know, pour water onto it, um, it, would, it didn't go back to the way it had been before. So we've got an element of fantastical... Um, the fantastical in this now so we've got this sort of magical element there um which again leads some leads us some questions um and i suppose the biggest question is why did the map change when it went in the river water but it didn't change when it went when she poured the water from home onto it um and unfortunately they're no closer to finding loop as far as we can tell from the story so far so i hope you enjoyed that um, have a think about uh, what's happened in the story uh, and I'll be back again tomorrow uh, with chapter 11 um, and in the meantime please keep working on the comprehension questions and the vocabulary um, there's quite a lot of complex vocabulary in the book um, and it's not necessarily words that you don't know it's just words that you might not have used in a particular context before so remember it's really important to always consider the word in the context not just um, the way that you think what you think it might mean um so make sure that you do that um, and well done to, the, to those of you who've already sent uh, your ideas and your work in to me and shona um so anyway see you tomorrow for chapter 11 bye